A 47 year old complains of diaphoresis, palpitations from the history only you should recognize it is fear. There is very little that on the MRI you recognize the adrenal mass. Uh, see, these are, these are the two kidneys and here you have the adrenal mass. And recognizing fear really doesn't take much time. And from where does it derive from? It derives from the neural crest is what you need to remember. All neural crest derivatives is one of the favorite questions of the examiner. There is an electron microscope between two adjacent cells, a dark line is being shown, which is very classical of uh, desmosome. What is the function of desmosome which is being shown to you? Typically, desmosome is the one which will um, uh, anchor two adjacent cells with one another is what you need to remember. So what will tight junctions do? What is jonular adherence? What are hemidesmosomes? etc etc you need to be very sure i leave the literature for you we invite dr shivani and many more who are all online now a high power view of a receptor is being shown what type of receptor this is encapsulated receptor and palm is hair bearing or a non hair bearing area non hair bearing area a capsulated receptor is typically a Meissner's corpuscle and uh, what is the function of Meissner? Meissner detects the object slipping and light touch on the non hairy surfaces. It is a capsulated receptor that is what you need to recognize. So we have for pain and temperature free nerve endings. Light touch Merkel disc. Then light touch in hairless area encapsulated Meissner. Deep pressure and stretches by rough knee and deep pressure, vibration, visceral pain, nausea, hunger, fullness, satiety, all these are Pacinian corpuscles is what you need to appreciate. Now, the lower respiratory tract has got specialized cells which is being shown to you. It is also the site for the cytochrome P450 dependent mixed oxidase functionality which is classical of clara cells is what you need to remember so the small intestine is responsible for absorption of nutrients then which is the one which is a macromolecule that can cross by passive diffusion instead of a energy supported active diffusion it is the free fatty acids so once we take complex fats they are all being broken down by the pancreatic lipase that creates the release of FFAs which are the ones which are directly absorbed into the lacteals that is what you need to understand. Now what is the main function of the structure which is being labeled in this uh, illustration. So this is a typical illustration histology of ileum. In the ileum you have the lymph node uh, collection called Pears patch. And Pears patch provides the immunosurveillance. We eat roadside Pani Puri. And uh, there will be some people, they can't stop uh, the impulse to eat. Pat pat pat, jo mile, kaha bhi mile, jaisa bhi mile. Pela kha ke, khane ke baad hi ho anxiety kam ho tha. That's the reason they will put nice mitais with a glass. Right? Eh? So like jewelry and the mitai shop what is common is they will put the, the consumables in a glass with some visibility transparent see like a semi nude uh, transparent uh, sari so that way those who have impulse can't stop they just jump on it so a 5 year old boy regular follow up for his genetic disorder typically has coarse facial features and clouded cornea and uh, he also has got a elevated serum hydrolase level that is a very important clue there is an entity called eye cell disease where it has a similar features clinical features like uh, the hunter and hurdler like mucopolysaccharidosis but the lysosomal hydrolase is typically elevated in it 
and the problem is with the Golgi apparatus in case of the eye cell disease. A little complicated question. You should, uh, but exam examiner will give some skating easy kind of questions. Few complicated. The idea of a mock test is to create those ups and downs, insults and appreciation, all sorts of emotions like the actual examination scenario. So that you become robust and insensitive when you go to the exam hall, right? That's very important. 23 year old complains of a painless swelling in her neck with fever, chills and lymph node biopsy. What is it showing? It is showing Hodgkin's lymphoma. So typically it is associated with what? It is caused by Epstein-Barr virus. Just knowing that is also not enough. What type of virus is Epstein-Barr virus you should know. Double standard linear DNA it is, is what need to be uh, basically remembered. So uh, 70 year old women presents with large flinging movements. What are they called? Hemibalismus. And CD is being shown to you. There is a lacunar infarct which is involving the area of subthalamic nucleus. So if you stimulate the subthalamic nucleus, what will it basically do? It will excite the internal segment of globus pallidus. For that you must know what is the typical direct and indirect pathway in the basal ganglia neurotransmission. If you go to the anatomy to medicine.com in the physiology, you have a lecture called uh, basal ganglia in the video library. Right? So there you go within 20 minutes. We will explain you direct pathway, indirect pathway, how does Parkinsonism, Huntington's chorea occur, what is the neurophysiology involved, lot of times questions come on this, on this area. So basal ganglia are like what? They are like the clutch wire in the vehicle. So you hold the clutch and press the brake. Similarly, when the motor cortex plans a motor activity, it starts getting feedback from the cerebellum and our ascending sensory system that is vibration and touch and pain and temperature. Then in turn all this information will also be fed into our basal ganglia. So basal ganglia will fine tune the original motor plan of the cerebral cortex. So basal gang ganglia have an ability either to stop or to support the motor plan of the motor cortex. So 20-25 minutes you need to invest your time to understand the direct and indirect pathway of the basal ganglia neurophysiology and definitely it is a rewarding question because now with the NEET exam almost 300 questions, 15-20 questions in physiology. Earlier days APPG entrance means don't read physiology. If you read physiology you are called as a mad guy. Did you not go for coaching of Dr. Murali Varadvash? They will uh, ask you if you are reading physiology. Because we tell, don't read physiology, don't read anatomy. Just read medicine, surgery, gynops thoroughly. And some of the topics list that we give to you. Huh? So, but now the life is little, little. But still, from there the 15 physiology question comes. There is once more 60 topics that we have given. Top 30 of that you read, those 15 questions you can answer. Right, doc? A 44 year old came for an annual gynecological examination. She has hyperactive bowel and uh, her, uh, um, there is a mass in the right adnexa and she is also having uh, hydrothorax and what is this mass showing? Spindle shaped cells of a fibroma. So ovarian fibroma. So what is that called? Meek syndrome is the typical answer. Of course hydrothorax, ovarian mass. You don't need to look at histology also. You are experts in discovering MIG. 33 year old with 3 month history of night sweats, several painless cervical lymph nodes are there. Is having lymphoma and uh, a pictorial spread of his lymphoma is being given. You should be in a position to tell whether this lymphoma is a Hodgkin's, I mean uh, is an Erbo or which class. So for that you must know. What is a an Erbor classification? If there is only one lymph node involved, stage 1, then axillary and cervical, stage 2, then under the diaphragm, 
then diffuse metastasis. Once more, if the fever night sweats are there, you call B, otherwise A. That's how you bro broadly classify. That's why it is a 3B is what you need to remember. 50-year-old woman with dark colored urine and she is not feeling well and there is a diminished air entry. Middle-aged woman, 180 by 110 is the blood pressure and uh, the serum chemistry shows increased creatinine. So what is your diagnosis is a very important question. So she also has got upper respiratory involvement, oral, nasal, paranasal involvement along with renal involvement puts it into vaginous glandular metastasis. That is how anchor positivity is being formed. So she has got a necrotizing lesion which is involving the upper respiratory tract, the nasal cavity. So that is how you basically make the diagnosis of uh, the vaginous granulometosis is what you need to basically remember. So we started uh, our click to clinic home healthcare uh, operation since yesterday. The, that is we send the doctors to the patient's home whenever they have a distress call, distress, they require a doctor next door. They call to us and we have empaneled our, a uh, lot of our students are uh, among the doctors who enrolled uh, uh, to go and see the patients in the home. So the first call we got a 70 year old woman who require a urgent consultation in Jubilee Hills. So immediately one of our doctor uh, who is there in the road number uh, uh, 12 Banjara Hills picked up the call and within 10 minutes he is there in the patient's place and then he gave a 10 minute consultation, wrote the prescription and collected about 800 rupees fee and uh, the patient's attendants are very happy. I thought uh, very happy means why did they call and why did this guy go and what did he give and let me feel so proud to see what he has written. I thought there may be, there would have been a pulmonary edema, he might have put uh, Lasix and uh, uh, what you call, uh, might have uh, initiated uh, some vasodilators of coronaries, something like that. Then when I checked that, was, there was bicopsules and multivitamin uh, and uh, calcium with vitamin D was there. Oh, then I thought, uh, I asked our uh, people, hey, please check. Uh, what actually patient had problem, how is the feedback about our doctor. They said, oh, we are very thankful to click to clinic uh, for sending the doctor and saving my mother's life. Uh, the patient's uh, son is actually uh, thanking and such a nice doctor. 10 minutes he sat and uh, gave uh, a uh, complete detailed evaluation of my mom. He saved the life of my mom and uh, uh, but the only thing is, if he ha if he would have brought a stethoscope and uh, BP apparatus, it would have been really great. That was the feedback. Then I said, okay, we'll try in that also. But still, patient's attendant is not irate because a availability, b behavior. Then comes the competence. Such a nice doctor. He came within 15 minutes on our call. So next time I want this doctor of click to clinic to come and take care of my mom, he said. Then I thought, uh, uh, true, that uh, availability, behavior, then comes the competence, very important. But at the same time, as good doctors, you should know what is the minimum soap notes, subjective, objective assessment plan that you need to write on a prescription. You should write what are the presenting complaints, what are the past complaints. What is the uh, auscultatory findings and at least hemodynamic stability of the patient? Suddenly, patient had MI after you left. Then, if he dies, your record that you are leaving behind is like a Supreme Court judgment, right? But good thing is he signed in the below after writing the uh, medicines. He signed below, but he would have written the physical findings. What is the provisional diagnosis? What is the past diagnosis? Patient is a case of diabetes, hypertension, well controlled, etc., etc. Then that would have been good. So only thing we need to do 
to wonderful post MBBS doctors who are ready to go home and see the patient. Lot of patients, geriatric patients. Honestly, also it is a great service to the patients because uh, the patient's grandson is a doctor, surgeon. She is granddaughter, is a surgeon. In fact, she is the one who request raised a request, who raised a request um, to see her grandmother because uh, she is not available very far from the patient. So first thing is availability, a good presentability. Third is the basic medications. What will be there? Hypertension, diabetes, bronchial asthma. Huh? A little good reasonable antibiotic policy these are the things that you need to adopt as good doctors at the same time if you see five six home visits also you will earn about three four thousand rupees a day which you don't earn uh, by working as duty doctors uh, someplace right so we will also conduct some free clinical practice guideline sessions so take opportunity sometimes to hang out in our uh, click to clinic uh, place and uh, try to um, try to learn some common ways of good prescription writing right doctor so now a baby is born to a 38 year old mother uh, with a little prenatal care there is a extra digit coming out of the hand Clef clip, cleft palate and all those things are there. So possibly what is it because of? Maternal disjunction. Because it is a classical clinical vignette about trisomy 13 is what you need to remember. Then uh, a child with T cell deficiency has the following features. What does he have? He has got a hypertilorism. Right? Then... The chromosomal pattern is showing 22Q deletion and the ECG is showing a long QT which is suggestive of hypocalcemia. So all these combinations fall into Dijorge syndrome and in the Dijorge syndrome what do you have? You have uh, hypoplastic thymus, tetralogy of fallow, cleft palate is what you need to basically remember. Now. A 35 year old, you remember this question number, 152. 35 year old, several swollen joints and uh, uh, she developed a bilateral crackles at the lung base and jugular venous distension and pedal edema is not there and a transesophageal is performed and her Physical appearance shows malar rash suggestive of SLE. In SLE, what type of endocarditis do you get? Libman Sachs endocarditis. And how do you describe the Libman Sachs? Small verrucous vegetations of the mitral valve is what you have to basically understand. A 48 year old woman with vague abdominal pain, diffusely enlarged nodular liver, and uh, the CT of the abdomen is being shown to you which is showing a mass in the liver, alpha fetoprotein being elevated, it is a case of hepatocellular carcinoma, which can be caused by the hepatitis B or C, which is a hepatinoviridae. The patient is suffering from upper respiratory infection and strange colored urine and uh, she had been on a statin for the high cholesterol levels. Then uh, an image has been shown to you, what is this image? Statin can cause rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis. And that rhabdomyolysis will lead to renal shutdown and uh, acute tubular necrosis. So, what you are seeing on the histology is fundamentally a statin induced rhabdomyolysis associated ATN is what you have to basically appreciate. A 50 year old presents because of substernal chest pain that has started 4 hours ago. And is becoming severe ECG is shown. What is it showing? You can see the ST segment elevation. Right? So, myocardial infarction. So, what is the laboratory test that is most specific for it? Troponin I is the one which is most specific for it uh, is uh, what you need to remember. A 23 year old man has a peripheral blood smear 
that reveals hypochromic microcytic RBC. A complete blood count indicates that the patient's hematocrit level is low normal, his RBC elevated, his red cell distribution width is normal and the electrophoresis pattern which one matches this condition. Now in this case what you need to know is there is a microcytic anemia. So there is a microcytic hypochromic anemia but the RDW is normal. What are the causes of microcytic hypochromic anemia? There can be iron deficiency anemia. There can be sideroblastic anemia. There can be thalassemia. Anemia of chronic inflammation. So how do you differentiate IDA and anemia of chronic inflammation? Ferritin is low here. Ferritin is high here. Then how do you differentiate IDA from thalassemia? Whenever iron deficiency anemia is there, RDW increases. So what is the meaning of red cell distribution width? Typically you will take a graph. Here you have the size of the RBCs. Here you have the number of RBCs. So every RBC size you will calculate. Suppose if the size of the RBC let us say is 20, you will somewhere this is 20 and you will point one dot here. This has got 21, you will point here. This has got 20, you will point here. So finally most of the RBCs fall in the area of one standard deviation here and there of 20. So this is, this width is called as RDW. So, but if you take iron deficiency anemia, there is a anisocytosis because of that. Jiski baby moti uska bhi bada naam hai, jiski baby lambi uska bhi bada naam hai. Ek mota RBC bhi paida hota hai, ek choti RBC paida hota hai, ek lambu RBC paida hota hai, right? Ek patle RBC tayar hota hai. So, if you take the shapes of RBCs, the shape will be wide. So, rest cell distribution width is increased. So, why anisocytosis occur in iron deficiency anemia? Typically, whenever the anemia is there, bone marrow is pushed into a tough job of producing more and more RBCs and doing that, it will create in hurry-burry different shapes of RBCs and RDW is increased. But in case of thalassemia, what will happen? Thalassemia also leads to anemia. But because of that anemia, when the bone marrow is demanded to produce RBCs, every RBC it produces has the same defect, genetic defect of decreased hemoglobin, decreased globin due to thalassemia. So that is the reason more or less all RBCs produced are of small size and equally suffer the defect. Bone marrow has no choice of producing one fat and one small. There is a reason here all will have a smaller size but they fall into a similar shape. There is a reason the rest cell distribution width is not much wider. Right? So RDW is not the size of the RBC. It is the size of the distribution of the various sizes of the RBC, that is what you need to understand. So here RDW being normal, what is it more likely, likely to be? Thalassemia. Now if the thalassemia is there, what happens if you do electrophoresis is a very important question. So typically whenever thalassemia is there, you have two types of chromosomes. Chromosome number 11, chromosome number 16. For gamma chain, delta chain, beta chain, it is a common chromosome. Whereas for alpha, there is a different uh, chromosome. If there is a mutation, typically beta thalassemia are all because of point mutations. Whenever there is a point mutation in beta chain production is defective, then there is a 
increased amount of gamma and delta and this unmarried alpha is there no its boyfriend uh, is preparing for entrance seat nahi mil raha shaadi ke liye taiyar nahi hai so whoever boyfriend can come forward it is ready to marry if required one or two also so that's the reason alpha gamma hbf levels will increase alpha delta hb a2 levels also will increase so the alpha beta hb a levels decrease so this kind of disproportionate increase of fetal hemoglobin and hb a2 but decrease of adult hb is the characteristic of beta thalassemia but if there is a alpha thalassemia there are three boys waiting to marry a girl but the girl said that after getting pg only i'll marry any of you bloody fellows then all the three are doing japam when will she get the seat so that at least one of us can marry her right so neither the alpha to beta to adult is decreased hb f also cannot form hb a2 also cannot form because for everything there is a common requirement of alpha so alpha thalassemia has caused anemia with a similar decrease of all types of hemoglobins beta thalassemia has lead to anemia with a decrease of adult hemoglobin on electrophoresis but the increase of hemoglobin f and hemoglobin a2 is what you need to basically understand now doctor so if you look at all these graphs uh, typically in the graph a there is a typical increase of uh, uh, hb a2 and also hb f that's how it has become the uh, graph of choice right b should be answered eh? ah b should be answered correct because b is the graph there hb a2 and hb f both of them are increased correct b should be correction b is correction correct correct b should be the answer 32 year old complaints of cough for the past 2 months increased shortness of breath and the x ray chest and lung biopsy are shown in the image what do you have bilateral potato shaped lymph nodes hilar lymph nodes can you appreciate hilar lymphadenopathy bilaterally this is uh, one lymph node this is one lymph node so bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy and non caseating granuloma on biopsy is being found so what is your diagnosis sarcoidosis how do you treat it we give dexamethasone is a part of the treatment 35 year old myeloproliferative disorder having both bleeding and thrombosis the platelet count is nearly 10 lakhs and the alkaline phosphatase is supra normal and bone marrow biopsy is showing increase in mega karyocytes it is a case of essential thrombocytosis three conditions are called myeloproliferative what are they chronic myeloid leukemia polycythemia rubra vera and essential thrombocytosis these three entities are called myeloproliferative states so what is the problem in essential thrombocytopenia if you do bone marrow biopsy thrombocytosis increase in platelet precursors alone mega karyocytes increase so that's the reason the diagnosis is essential thrombocytemia is what you have to basically remember now a 42 year old is the audio fine bilateral leg weakness lower back pain knee jerk reflexes are diminished and there is a diarrheal illness preceding that and there is a albumino cytologic dissociation in the csf which is very classical of gulen barry which is acute post infectious demyelinating polyneuritis is the name given so there is a reason typically you find myelination of the peripheral nervous system is the one which is affected 85 year old he is feb1 by fec 60% which is obstructive pattern and uh, x ray chest is being shown there is a cardiomegaly and uh, a very dirty bronchovascular markings suggest of bronchitis so bronchitis is associated with hypertrophy of mucus secreting glands is what you need to understand 
63 year old has weakness in his legs the extraocular muscles and the muscles of the facial expression are intact and uh, there is a reduced uh, uh, tendon reflexes and uh, sensation is normal there is no rash and histology typically is of dermatomyositis polymyositis so typically what is the type of population of uh, infiltration occur in polymyositis dermatomyositis once more what is the difference between biopsy of dermato and polymyositis one of them is interfascicular inflammation one is intrafascicular fascicles will be there no muscle fascicles that is the difference in their histopathology so lymphocytic infiltration is what you typically find a 3 day old typically he appears normal to small at birth and uh, obstruction and aspiration ruled out his chest radiograph shows respiratory distress syndrome which is very typical pre term baby is vulnerable to respiratory distress syndrome a term baby delivered by cesarean and he is having dyspnea what is a condition transient tachypnea of newborn right so all the three four conditions how to differentiate meconium ileus meconium aspiration transient tachypnea of newborn and uh, respiratory distress syndrome and uh, neonatal pneumonias how to differentiate the four favorite question in pediatrics which you have to be very sure so it is a type 2 pneumocyte which is basically abnormal in him now uh, a 60 year old the uh bullae are being shown which are tense bullae and uh, immunofluorescence pattern shows dermoepidermal junction deposition which is very classical of bullous pemphigoid now during a routine visit a 55 year old woman uh, she has a singular thyroid nodule and uh, what is being shown to you orphan any id cells papillary projections which are classical of papillary carcinoma of the thyroid if you take the recent dnb neat pg exams orphan any id cells and uh, papillary projections is a favorite uh, histological slide in aims uh, dnb neat pg question bank right such questions you should not do wrong 40 year old typically has recent onset seizures and there is a tumor hanging out of the uh, meninges so classical of meningioma so what do you find in meningioma laminated calcified calcified concretions samoma bodies are what you see in case of meningioma and also in papillary carcinoma then 47 year old slow growing tumor right frontal lobe in the brain and histology is showing oligodendrocytes so it is a case of oligodendroglioma and what is the function of oligodendrocytes myelination of the central nervous system there are schwann cells to the myelination of peripheral nervous system a patient is brought to clinic with complaints of myoclonus epilepsy and muscle weakness so what is that mitochondrial myopathy where you get myoclonus epilepsy muscle weakness typically it is called as uh, ragged ragged red fibers of the muscle along with myoclonus epilepsy that is a classical example of a mitochondrial like leber's optic neuropathy ragged red fibers with myoclonus epilepsy syndrome huh? these are all examples of what mitochondrial myopathies 47 year old long standing dysphagia to solids and uh, a upper endoscopy was done i don't know whether the image came to you or not correctly esophageal web was there there was a esophageal web and uh, you see a microcytic anemia so please don't forget your uh, smartphone they will give a link just you type that link you will get that news for medico.com all these images in a sequence so that you can see high colored images so to you are writing paper based exam you can go through the high colored images on your mobile hmm?
So, it is a case of plumber Vinson syndrome, hypochromic microcytic anemia, iron deficiency, esophageal web, glossitis, etc. etc. 47 year old comes with weight gain, fatigue and lethargy. There is a firm thyroid nodule. Histology is showing Hashimoto's thyroiditis, lymphocytic infiltration. And uh, typically, what do you find in that? Antimicrosomal antibodies. If you see lot of people in our community who come with hypothyroidism with goitrous enlargement, ultimately when you do the uh, serum assessment, antimicrosomal antibody positivity will turn up. Right? So, uh, that's the reason evaluation of hypothyroidism in a middle-aged person presenting with a enlarged thyroid. As a medical student, MBBS, post MBBS student going for a home visit on click to clinic, you must know how to evaluate the diagnostic algorithms you should be quite sure about.